Thank you and welcome for being here today as on the panel. Dr. Danga just gave her introduction. My apologies, but now we are going to Dr. Mehra to introduce herself. Dr. Mehra, all yours. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. And thank you uh, for organizing this excellent uh, and very, like Dr. Danga just mentioned, very um, inclusive conference with people from all over the world. Um, it's such an honor to share this panel with uh, the likes of Dr. Nawaz and Dr. Dangaj with, you know, such uh, great accomplishments. So uh, yeah, I'm happy to, you know, share whatever insights I have on, on this topic of discussion and whatever my journey has been so far. Uh, I'm a current PGY3 resident at North Alabama Medical Center. And uh, like Dr. Kashyap just mentioned, uh, I will uh, soon be joining as a hospitalist physician in a Washington state. Um, research has been just a great um, interest of mine. So I, I'm just really glad that uh, I was able to pursue it through these three years under great guidance and mentorship. And uh, this is a great platform to share that experience. I see Dr. Bansal here as well, and uh, he had a huge role to uh, play in, in my journey uh, as an early researcher. So uh, glad to see these faces and uh, thank you for having me. Fantastic. Dr. Nawaz, you know the drill. Thank you, Dr. Kashyap. And uh, again, a warm welcome to everyone to the GRRSP Annual Congress. I am very happy to uh, be a part of this panel and to share and learn from all of you today. Um, I'm Dr. Faisal Nawaz, a, uh, uh, based in Dubai and actually uh, one of the GRRSP faculty members, as well as uh, someone who leads the social media in research department. Um, essentially, it is how we could use and utilize social media to conduct research studies in healthcare and, and publish great papers around it. So that's one of the things we do as part of our six months mentorship training, which is a structured online program uh, for IMGs, medical students, physicians around the world. Uh, so it's been a pleasure actually working as, as part of this program and seeing some of our alumni here join us today, some of our uh, active uh, scholars as well, part of this. Um, at the same time in Dubai, I'm also a, a resident physician in psychiatry. So I am part of uh, the training program here and uh, research has been something that uh, always uh, made me uh, feel a lot more alive and energetic early on as a medical student. So uh, to use that and to share some of those experiences today is uh, what I'd like to give back as a way of paying, paying forward to some of the support that I once had as a mentee and I continue to do so. So thank you again. Absolutely. Well, thank you, three of you as well. So uh, as I've asked uh, the the audience to ask questions in the chat box and I'll try to bring it to you as well. So feel free, please, uh, uh, in the moderation. So my first question to probably to, same question to all of you, but I'll go to you, Dr. Dangayaj. Now, uh, you know, the group which is attending today is predominantly IMGs, international medical graduates, or those who are either medical student here, or uh, they have been in that route as well. So my first question is, what are the, what you can tell from your, each of your journey uh, so far now, the value of uh, this mentoring and research, we all have about mentoring, mentoring is a buzzword, but what does mentoring mean, meant to you in your journey? Uh, and if very briefly, three of you can touch upon, so Dr. Dangayash followed by Dr. Mehra and Dr. Nawaz. Thank you, Rahul, for such an excellent question. I think mentoring has been the very thread of continuity for every uh, stepping stone to success in my career. And that's why I'm so passionate about mentoring and paying it forward. And I didn't know for the longest time there was a difference between mentoring and sponsor sponsoring. And I think it's important to distinguish between those two because a mentor serves as a guide, as an advisor, believes more in you than you believe in yourself. And I was so blessed uh, throughout my journey, right from medical school to, uh, you know, at this stage in my career as an associate professor, I have several, several mentors. And sponsors are those people in our lives that, uh, connect us to um, specific resources, their own connections, helping us leverage some of those for us to be able to succeed. So there's both a role for mentoring and sponsoring. And what I'd like to specifically highlight about my mentors, so right from my med school, so uh, Karnad sir, and in India, because when I did my medical school in India, we call everybody sir and madam, right? So 
um, Karnat sir, who who was one of the first intensivists that uh, who I had the pleasure of working with, I realized, you know, very quickly that this is probably what I want to do. Because when I got into med school, I thought I wanted to go into surgery. So one key lesson that I learned is when you see people who are doing amazing things, that role modeling, that that role that role modeling plays in our lives um, as folks in medicine uh, is perhaps more powerful than any other field. So I realized very quickly that I need to keep my eyes and ears open and see what amazing people around me were doing. So uh, drawing some inspiration from there. So moving from there to my residency, um, uh, I didn't even know neurocritical care existed as a field. So my first rotation at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio was under Dr. Michael DeGiorgia. And of course, moving to the US, I was told I'm supposed to call everybody by their first names. So you call them Dr. So-and-so, which was a big, which was a big change for me. But it doesn't in any any way change that level of respect that you have for one another. But you are also treated as a peer, which which all of my mentors impressed upon me. And uh, Dr. Michael DeGiorgio, just watching him round, I realized, okay, this is what I would love to do and receive tremendous encouragement and moving forward to Columbia Cornell for my for my fellowship with Dr. Stefan Mayer and Jan Klassen and all these amazing people who were doing truly path-breaking research, taking the field forward, that sort of hunger, that thirst to continue learning and to identify my own core values. So your mentors can help you identify your core values that are going to hold you in good stead no matter what your, your um, stage of career is. And as I became, as I started moving from, you know, junior faculty to becoming sort of, I hate to call myself mid-career, but, you know, I think it's sort of, it's sort of mid-career right now. But I realized for all those different domain areas, whether it was uh, my research uh, interests, understanding how to conduct clinical trials, so with Dr. Kevin Shett, even outside of my institution, so identifying mentors who are not necessarily always at your own institution. So Dr. Kevin Sheth, who's over at Yale, Dr. Wes Ely, who's over at Vanderbilt. I just reached out to these folks and said, hey, would, could you please mentor me? I need mentoring in, in these specific areas. And then identifying people who are not in your own field. Dr. Kristen Dams O'Connor, who happens to be a rehab neuropsychologist, is one of my, uh, one of my mentors, and social media. I would not have known anything about social media had it not been for Dr. Christopher Carroll, who's a pediatric intensivist. And there was no way I would have met a pediatric intensivist as part of my journey as an adult neurointensivist. So one key um, lesson from there is keep your eyes and ears open for who, who can inspire you. Don't be afraid to reach out to people to serve as your mentors. In organizations, so I serve in various capacities in different organizations, whether it's the American Academy of Neurology, Society of Critical Care Medicine, Neurocritical Care Society, CHEST. It's my way of paying it forward, but I also have organizational mentors. So I think that's also, you know, supremely important that if you want to engage in organizations and committees, outside of your home institution, identifying mentors within those organizations can also help you not only navigate, but also use the platform that these organizations provide to the fullest of their, um, to, to the fullest potential. So uh, I think I'm, you know, in a snapshot, I've shared, shared what my, you know, experience has been with amazing mentors. They never expected me to become like them but help me identify what my own strengths are, what areas am I going to need to work on so I can succeed to the fullest of my potential. Thank you, Dr. Congrats. Dr. Mehra, same question, but uh, if you can limit your answer and probably uh, you know, share the question is, what mentoring has meant to you uh, so far in your career? Uh, it mentoring at any stage of my career has has actually been you know path defining for me uh, ever since medical school like Dr. Dangayach was mentioning I think that's a very formative part of your journey and when people propel you forward in a direction that you're interested in I think that's the role of a mentor in that at that stage 
but i think um, as a as your career evolves uh, the mentor mentee relationship kind of evolves as well uh, your requirements uh, as both mentor and mentee evolve with a period over a period of time so uh, in medical school, I think it was a sense of direction, a uh, sort of validation uh, that I was seeking from my mentors, you know, making sure I was headed in a way, in a place where I, it's a good fit for me, whether they agreed with that, you know, that was my primary uh, relationship with them at the time. But as you know, I journeyed along uh, the USMLE path and I uh, had different US clinical experiences. I actually met mentors at every observership site or externship site that I, I was at, and they provided different kinds of insights uh, at those stages. And those were the things that I needed at the time. For example, you know, I just I did an observership at a Tampa General Hospital in Florida and a cardiologist that I worked with over there. <clears throat> Dr. Danny Syed was the, the cardiologist's name, and he was just really uh, keen on making me understand how to present cases uh, when, you know, you're transitioning from the Indian to the U.S. medical system. There's a whole different way in which you should present your medical cases, and his role there was, was profound in helping me excel at my observership roles in other, you know, clinical experiences. So that's, that's how you progress. Um, as far as identifying a mentor, I think it's it's your own required requirements at the time that help you identify uh, whether your interests are aligned with the mentors and whether your attitudes are similar. It's it's not necessarily like a like a take relationship. It's actually a give and take relationship where you mutually benefit from each other. Um, and I think um, that's that's something that I understood closer to when I was getting into research uh, and uh, I met Dr. Kashyap and, uh, and you know, we, we had the first GRRSP uh, batch at the time, which was just an idea that, that was discussed between a mentor and a mentee and that kind of led to this organization. And I think uh, over the last four or five years, profound things have come out of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, out of the, the th I did not even know that, you know, the number that Dr. Kashyap cited about uh, the number of articles, I did not even realize that, <laughs> but but I can safely say about 25 of those came out of that mentorship uh, relationship. So, so I think that has been my journey so far in terms of how I would express my relationship with uh, a mentor. Thank you so much, Dr. Nawaz. Thirty seconds. What is what has mentoring meant to you so far? Yes, absolutely. I think I might need even less than thirty seconds for that because it's essentially two words that come to my mind, and uh, I think both uh, Dr. Dengaj and Dr. Mehra have, have really rounded it up for us today. But for me. I think of it as a very collaborative learning environment at the end of the day. So there is no hierarchy when it comes to a mentor-mentee relationship. It's a bond that's mutually beneficial, as, as we talked about, uh, but also one which involves a lot of respect and gratitude both ways. Um, and you can have more than one mentors in that space. That's one of the other points we've really come out. So for me, uh, a mentor is someone who is there for me in my journey. And it's about them looking into what are my needs and how can I get to a certain goal with the requirements that come. And some of their experiences may help play a role there, but it's not necessarily about shaping their journey and becoming like them. It They will help you become the best version of what you'd like to be. So often we sometimes look at our mentors as I'd like to be like them and mirroring their path, but we realize sooner that everyone has a very unique path and the, the good mentor is the one who can spot the uniqueness of their mentee's path. And, and to me, that's that's what makes an ideal mentor. Thank you. It, thank you. It is true that you can never shut up a psychiatrist even you give them 30 seconds. Uh, but uh, I think I'm going to go into rapid fire round because we want to answer as many as questions from our audience. And please, by all means, uh, keep answering there, both the, uh, all three of the panelists. My question to you first, Dr. Mehra, is uh, if you can objectively tell what would be two qualities you would look or suggest into a mentor, the ideal mentor, and, and then why? So uh, two quick qualities and two sentences about it. I think patience is a quality that I would look for in a mentor because it's uh, sometimes it takes some time to come on the same page. Uh, with what the mentee needs in that moment and what the mentor can 
you know guide and coming to that conclusion may need some time and patience um and i think the uh, other uh, quality which may seem a little bit odd is kind of detachment so you detach yourself from the mentee uh, in a way that you can look at things objectively so you don't you know you're you're not partial to them or you're not showing them uh, a picture that's necessarily better than it is so you detach yourself from the situation you look at it objectively and give them the best advice that you can in that moment possible and i think those would be my two uh, two qualities that i would look for in a mentor fantastic dr nava same question now, and you have 20 seconds now sure so from my side i think one one word that comes is belonging essentially i think this quality of making the mentee feel that they belong as part of the mentor mentee relationship as part of their dreams their speciality and a lot of that is validation that happens throughout that journey so uh, to my mentees as well that's something i try to reinforce that they're already a part of the the dream they're building and even though it's not fully ready and formed yet that's where the mentor comes in and makes them realize that it's one step at a time of a journey so if they can feel belonging and if they can feel understood through validation i think that would make some very strong qualities in a in a mentor fantastic dr dangaj uh, what would be one or two quality in an ideal mentor for you i think being available uh, so availability and generosity uh, the creative aspects and innovation and and being willing to listen all of those things i totally agree with everything that that uh, both um dr smeda and dr uh, fawaz have shared i totally agree with all of that fantastic uh let me ask the third rapid fire question this time dr nawaz to you as well um uh, tell us uh, one of the biggest misconception about mentoring in medicine actually in your opinion or what you have seen around it uh misconception maybe pitfall uh in, you can take it in any direction you have 25 seconds this time thank you for that generosity so i'm going to uh actually just reflect back a bit into how it was being a medical student and uh one of the myths i think commonly that we find is that in order to seek a mentor i have to be at a level that is enough to please them or to have enough achievements and accomplishments to earn a mentorship position uh mentee mentor uh, bond but i think that's that's a myth that needs to be broken that's exactly why we're seeking mentorship is to reach to a level where we're proud of ourselves down the lane so you don't need to have any uh accomplishments or a background experience as long as there's an interest there is accountability to your work and you're respecting their time as much as yours everyone deserves a mentor and 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 that should you know make them feel confident enough about seeking one as well fantastic uh, now i would like to ask you guys to give your concluding remarks what do you want your audience to leave with one message of your own uh, maybe i will go in order with dr dangaj dr mehra and then fazal uh, dr nawasti dr dangaj the most important thing is being grateful as you progress in your journey and as you continue to grow if you forget the people who helped you along the way if you forget to thank your mentors along the way then you are doing a disservice to yourself as much as much as to the mentors that have really helped you succeed what you take away from that particular experience is to pay it forward you have got to be the amazing mentors that you were you were um lucky enough to to encounter so you want to become those mentors to the people you're going to encounter at the same time remember to acknowledge how grateful you are because it's that kind of gratitude that makes you realize that you're part of something bigger than yourself dr mehra your concluding remarks um i think um there i think dr dangaj has already addressed that in the chat somebody had asked about finding mentors uh, i think it's a continual process to keep identifying people who have al aligned interests with you and you know are going to be strong advocates for you and you can have a good relationship with them um and i think that's something that we should never stop looking for in our careers no matter where we are uh and then of course pay it forward when you have the chance to do so and always reflect back and uh, remember to rem you know to be grateful about the journey that you've had so far i think that's what i would say as well very well said dr dr nawaz 
Yes, I love that. So I think from my side, it's more about that every experience you're going to have in life as a mentee or a mentor, you either win or you learn from them. There's no real loss that comes out of it. So the same goes with your mentorship experiences. Reach out. Don't think too much into whether this is the perfect relationship for me. Give it a start. Give it a try. Uh, worst case scenario is sort of, you know, them saying no or not replying. But the best case scenario is you either win or you learn. So that's that's something I'd like us all to take back. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That's the only time we have it. I wish we could have it for two hours. So that is something we can take it back to see. We can extend these uh, panel discussion for longer time. Please stay around. Uh, please respond to the question in the chat box. Uh, there are several questions. We didn't get a chance to go there. You kind of cover quite a few of them as well. We will. I would like to thank three of you, Dr. Dangaj, Associate Professor Dr. Dangaj, Dr. Nish Ishita Mehra, Dr. Faisal Nawaz for being here today with us, sharing your experience, sharing your uh, uh, take on these things as well. We hope to bring you back again uh, very soon, but really, really thankful. Uh, all audience, please, you can put your heart sign or like sign and clapping sign on the Zoom to showcase your love for uh, three of them. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, uh, please uh, stick around and answer questions in the chat box. We are going to move to our next session, which is going to be led by Dr. Nawaz. Excellent. So welcome again, everyone. I think this has been a very productive uh, last couple of sessions for us. And we started the day with some amazing keynote speeches and we've come through abstract presentations from pretty much around the world. And now that we've just concluded our panel discussion, giving you a few ideas about what is mentorship and where it can lead you, we're back again to sort of continue some of our other abstract presenters who've been uh, working hard in their own research journeys and are here to share with us some of their um, projects and studies to, to gain inspiration from. So without further ado, I would like to welcome and begin this session uh, just as sort of uh, housekeeping uh, notes from our side. So you will be, as a speaker, please make sure to keep it to five minutes in terms of your presentation. And then we'll have about two minutes for our judges to ask any questions that you may have for our listeners, we have our chat box, so you can use that to ask questions and our speakers after their talk will answer those questions for you. And other than that, you will be looking also as a speaker at Dr. Kashyap's screen for the color changes from green to yellow to red as a, as a heads up for when your talk is coming to an end. All right, so the first presenter we have, and I will be sharing my screen now just in a bit. Perfect. So the first presenter we have is Ayush Haldar. Um, Ayush, can you see the screen and can you, um, are you available with us today? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Perfect. So Ayush, the, the stage is yours. I will now uh, make this full screen and can start. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Ayush Haldar and my topic is in the uh, in neurology and I've conducted a meta-analysis and the question that I'm uh, the question that I was trying to solve is can apolipoprotein E targeted drugs be used to treat Alzheimer's disease? And next next slide. So a background on why apolipoprotein E. So the apolipoprotein E is considered a, a, like a cholesterol carrier. So if we think in terms of what it does in blood is that it is responsible for uptake of, uh, uptake of remnants of lipids from the blood into the liver. But in brain, there is a role in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. And as we know, Alzheimer's disease is one of the leading causes of death worldwide. And this apolipoprotein E can be expressed in uh, three isoforms, uh, previous slide. Can I go to the previous slide? Yeah. 
and the three isoforms are apo e4 e3 and e2 of this e4 is considered harmful and is also one of the important genetic risk factors for alzheimer's disease and e2 is considered protective and so the thought was apo e targeted drugs could be seen as something that we can target and treat the alzheimer's disease next slide So, of the current drugs approved, approved for Alzheimer's disease are cholinesterase inhibitors and NMDA antagonists, that is memantine. And there are many novel approaches, and of these, amyloid beta monoclonal antibody targeted therapy is approved by FDA, the two drugs adagamunab and lecanemab. And in China, there is another drug, sodium oligomenate, that is targeting the drug brain axis. And another a uh, study has been targeting tau proteins and a meta analysis done recently showed no likely impact so now my focus on the study is to target the apoe next slide so based on this we were assessing the effectiveness of these drugs and we included pubmed embase scopus and the Cochrane Central Registry, so total four. And all the data, uh, and what we have done is, we have taken norm, data from normal, uh, mild cognitive impaired and uh, Alzheimer's patients. We have taken the data from clinical trials, and the control was the placebo. And we have taken five cognitive outcomes that are ADASCOG, MMSC, ADCS, NPI, and CD, CDI, uh, SOB. So these are the five scales we have taken. And we have taken the data, found the mean difference and the standard deviation, and uh, used the random effects model as a model for meta analysis. Next page. So, more than 2,000 records were identified, and at the end, we found 12 drugs of these two were retinoid X receptor agonists, and the rest were PPAR gamma agonists, the rosiglitazone and pyglitazone. Next. So, first, we'll move on to Adas Cox scale. So, when the meta analysis was done, we found uh, 10 studies of these. Uh, we have included nine. As you can see, one of them has been excluded to reduce the heterogeneity from 72 to 64%. And there was an, uh, it was, and we have seen that compared to placebo, the drugs were found to be uh, effective. Uh, the, although the change in mean difference was uh, 0.98, but we can see that it is favorable and it has shown slight improvement in uh, Adas Cox score. Next slide. Yeah, it, and uh, then we move on to the MMSC, MMSC scoring. And here, also in, there was no total efficacy found, but strictly speaking of pyoglitazone, we can see that it was effective and we can see that the scores have significantly improved in the pyoglitazone group regarding MMSC. Next slide. And the other three, in the other three scales, we did not find anything significant. Next slide. Next and final, this is the final slide. So we have concluded that from a study PPAR gamma agonists, yes, they were seen as significantly effective. They can be tried as drug to prevent cognitive decline in Alzheimer's patient. And in practice, we can think of, in a, since elderly patient are, we can see other comorbidities like type two diabetes. So in such patients, adding PBAR gamma agonists along with other first line drug, we can see a, a cognitive improvement as well. And what I am looking forward to is, the retinoid X receptor agonist, which is uh, dexarotene, we I want I would like to see like more uh, therapies targeting the retinoid as the retinoid X receptor agonist. Thank you.
next slide yeah thank you very much Thank you very much, Ayush. Uh, this has been a very interesting presentation on, on treatment uh, options for uh, Alzheimer's disease as a, as a systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, we will have any questions for Ayush answered in the chat, questions asked in the chat box, and that's where our speakers will answer those questions as well. Any questions from our judges at the moment? Uh, congratulations on your interesting presentation. My question is regarding your results. They were statistically significant, but were, were they also clinically relevant? So did the improvement in the cognitive decline was clinically relevant or just statistically significant? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so if I were to speak uh, regarding the ADASCO, since we saw the totals, uh, there was mean difference was uh, minus around minus one. So the ADAS Cox score is zero to 70. And considering the difference with placebo, it is the score is just the difference is just one. So it is uh, definitely, uh, uh, it is of course statistically significant, but uh, as of uh, speaking clinically, we'd, it's not really that significant since the since that amounts to only around 1.4 percentage, that score of one out of 70. But regarding uh, pioglitazone, uh, uh, regarding the uh, subset analysis of just pioglitazone, uh, in pioglitazone also, it was statistically significant for ADAS group, but uh, the point difference was 3.36, uh, the mean difference compared to placebo. So, if I were to put it into percentage based on the 70 point ADAS Cox score, it is like a 5% change. So it is to be seen, more uh, studies are to be seen regarding pioglitazone. Since out of all the drugs, it was seen as the uh, most efficacious. So it is to be seen. Excellent. Thank you, Anish, again. And uh, we will now move on to our next presentation. This is by Dr. Diksha Murlidhar. Uh, Dr. Diksha, are you with us today? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Excellent. I'm now sharing my screen. Please let me know once you can see it. Yes, I can see it. Perfect. You may begin your presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my topic is a study of correlation between HER2 overexpression in uh, non small cell lung carcinoma and uh, disease prognosis. Can we move to the next slide? So, a little bit of background um, about lung cancer. As we know, it is one of the leading cause of cancer-related death worldwide, and adenocarcinoma is the most common uh, subtype of non-small cell lung carcinoma. And despite all the advances in screening and treatment, the five-year survival rate has been low at around 10 to 15 percent. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, so many breast and gastric cancers have been found to carry HER2 amplifications and the protein is overexpressed in these tumors. HER2 genetic alterations have also been described in non-small cell lung carcinoma. So uh, I aim to study the correlation between HER2 overexpression and disease prognosis. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, so we use the following inclusion exclusion criteria in our uh, uh, in our uh, systematic review. So the inclusion criteria were uh, HER2 overexpression in non-small cell lung carcinoma. And we studied uh, uh, original clinical uh, studies uh, done since 2010. And the exclusion criteria were case reports and other systematic reviews and articles not in English. Let me go to the next slide. Now the search was conducted on PubMed, Scopus, and Embase using keywords such as prognosis, survival, mortality, non-small cell lung carcinoma, and HER2. Uh, relevant articles were exported and screened by independent uh, researchers as well. And the data relevant to the topic being studied was recorded in a tabular column and the results analyzed. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so 125 potentially relevant abstracts were uh, found during our uh, literature search, out of which six studies were included in the analysis after doing a full text review based on the inclusion exclusion criteria. Go to the next slide. Uh, results. 
A systematic review of the available literature suggested a relatively poor prognosis in non-small cell lung carcinoma patients with HER2 overexpression in the tumor, especially in the adenocarcinoma type of non-cell lung carcinoma and in non-smokers. As you can see, a study by Yun Kyung et al. showed a 61.6 .6 predominance of non-smokers in patients which had HER2 overexpression. And another study showed 62.05%. The median age of patients uh, would, uh, who had adenocarcinoma uh, was 66, and we also studied uh, squamous cell carcinoma type of the non-small uh, cell lung carcinoma, and the median age of these patients was 74.25. Let me go to the next slide. So a study uh, which showed, uh, which was, uh, which uh, subdivided the adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma and scored them uh, based on the ASCO criteria. Uh, which showed that the uh, adenocarcinoma score three had the worst prognosis and squamous cell carcinoma score three also had uh, metastatic presentations and positive uh, lymph node metastasis. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, another study done by King Ja Exal showed a five-year overall survival of 65% versus 86% in patients who had HER2 overexpression. And uh, patients with HER2 overexpression in the tumor presented with lymph node metastasis, as I mentioned before, and uh, many presented with recurrence of cancer. The tumors with HER2 overexpression were moderate to poorly differentiated, indicating a worse prognosis overall. Go to the next slide, please. So conclusion, uh, the results of this study uh, in a clinical scenario could be used to determine prognosis and improve patient outcome by targeted treatment. Um, a few limitations of my study was that most of the studies included were done in Asian countries, such as China, Japan, and Korea, raising the question of possible environmental or genetic impact on the patients. And a couple of papers relevant to our study were in a foreign language and hence were not able to be included in the study. Thank you. Any questions, please? Thank you very much, Dr. Diksha. That was a very well-informed presentation and also uh, good to see our own GRRSP alumni part of uh, this Congress and uh, showcasing their projects as well. So thank you for that. We'll now move to our judges to have any questions from their side. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so do you hear my voice? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for sharing your exercise with us. So I have a question. Um, actually, you uh, explained your conclusion, but I want you to expand it. So how can the results of the study be used to inform clinical practice uh, and improve the management of uh, mass mortal carcinoma patients? Um, so during my literature search, I found that a lot of uh, studies, they use the HER2 criteria and uh, they had a targeted treatment. That is, they use different type of drugs to target uh, cancers based on the fact that they were HER2 positive. So I believe that with more research, we can, uh, if their patients are HER2 positive uh, cancer, we can target them with specific drugs, which um, help uh, with um, their prognosis as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, your presentation was really great. So it's clear that you have a a great deal of effort and dedication to your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our listeners can ask questions in the chat box and speakers will reply directly there. Uh, we will now move to our next presenta presentation, which is by Tibian Nurullah Muhammad from the University of Khartoum in Sudan. Uh, Tibian, are you with us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. I am sharing my screen. Let me know once you see the screen and we can start presenting them. Yes, can you see my screen, uh, Tibian? Your audio is not clear at the moment, Tibian. Could you confirm if you can see the screen? Yes, I can. I can see the screen. All right, you can start presenting. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tibian Nullah. I'm going to present uh, uh, injury in pediatrics um, in Dr. Salman Alice's Center 2022. 
we can go to the next slide. Uh, about the acute kidney injury, it, um, it means the acute injury to the kidney, which in pediatric can present uh, from a minor uh, insult to a total enuric kidney failure. Uh, worldwide, there is 13.3 million people uh, get affected with acute kidney injury each year. 85% uh, of them are from developing countries. So Africa has a significant burden of acute kidney injury. Uh, my aim was uh, to add or to have uh, the data that could help in early detection and intervention so can, we can prevent the further complication of the disease. The disease in the developed country is uh, a disease of elderly uh, with multi-organ failure or comorbidities, but in developing countries, it's a disease of uh, children or pediatric uh, with only one um, cause. So my aim was to detect or to describe the etiologies and clinical presentation. Next slide. So the method I took was a chart review descriptive study. I reviewed the patient forms uh, who diagnosed with acute kidney injury and presented to Selma Dell's Center from uh, 2017 to 2021. Uh, uh, my study population was the pediatric patient less than 18 years old who referred or presented to the Torselma Dell's Center. Uh, and it's the center, um, the main referred center for uh, uh, Soba Hospital, like the catchment area uh, is for 5 million people. So I choose uh, the center uh, for this reason. The, I structured my questionnaire from the previous studies. Uh, the questionnaire contained a, uh, a question about the demographic data and clinical presentation and outcome. Next slide, please. After analyzing the data, I found the age of the patients was uh, varying from 33 days to 17 years, and the mean uh, age was eight years old. Uh, the male population were more than female. I beg your, bar your pardon about this mistake. They were uh, 46 males and 30 females. I'm sorry about the mistake. 60% uh, 60.5% of my population were males. Uh, most of them were from a low socioeconomic state, 90.8% of them. Next slide, please. Fabian, can you hear us? I think we have, uh, we lost you at a few seconds ago. You could keep your video off if there's a connection issue going on. Yes, we can see you now, Tibian. Um, you can keep your video off to help with the the, the connection and continue your presentation. Pranavaz, uh, she has dropped off and we are almost at time. No worries. Thank you for that presentation. And uh, we will now move forward to the next presenter uh, in line. So we have uh, Dr. Smitesh Parte who will be presenting. Uh, Dr. S uh, Smitesh, are you with us today? Yes, yes, I'm with you. Uh, I hope I'm audible and all clear, visible. Yes, you are visible and audible. I will just be sharing my screen now and uh, we will begin the presentation. Right. Perfect. Please start presenting. Yes, once you uh, Dr. Faisal, before I begin, uh, my slides might have a few animations. So can you load the slide entirely? So that will be better for our judges and the viewers to read it sure. together. 
Sure. Yeah. Sure. All right. Thank you. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking my peer researchers, the judges and the organizers to give me an opportunity to present my paper, The Impact of Diabetes Mellitus on Mortality in Pulmonary Artery Hypertension, a Systematic Review and a Meta-Analysis. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Smitesh Parthi, MBBS, and I had an opportunity to work with brilliant sets of mind and an amazing mentor to get this paper to fruition. Next slide, please. Yeah, one more. That's it. Uh, a small refresher course, pulmonary artery hypertension is a progressive chronic vascular disease characterized by endothelial dysfunction. Now, just like any other vascular disease, uh, a progressive vascular disease, it has its fair share of comorbidities that is implicated in its pathogenesis. We have the most common hypertension, we have a CAD, we have COPD or even congestive heart failure. Amongst those is diabetes mellitus, the topic of our interest today. But that begs the question, why are we here? What is the question that I'm trying to answer? What is the research gap that we're trying to fill here? Now, although diabetes mellitus has been linked to pathogenesis in pH patients, the impact that diabetes has on mortality remains uncertain and unstudied. That's where this paper comes in. Next, please, please. And one more. Thank you. Uh, so for a methodology, we went through two most expansive electronic bibliographical databases, PubMed and Embase. We use relevant terms like mortality, DM, pH, club them together with appropriate Boolean operators to get a search protocol. Now, our goal was clear. We had to include papers that talked about mortality in pH patients with two separate distinct groups, diabetes and non-diabetics. So for that, we included full text peer reviewed articles in only English language. And to keep our research relevant, only articles from last 10 years were included. Uh, a quick glance, everyone, at my Prisma flowchart will tell you that we started from 901 articles, trickled down to 34 that were eligible for full text screening, and from which only seven were handpicked for our meta-analysis. Next page, please, Dr. Pranavas. Yeah, thank you. Uh, out of those seven, one was a randomized controlled trial and six were cohort studies. Uh, for each study, we calculated a crude odds ratio using raw data for events and non-events and also a randomized effects model to account for variability within and between the studies. The outcomes were analyzed using the mantle hazard method for dichotomous data to establish the pooled odds ratio. Now we anticipated heterogeneity and we calculated it with using the Cochrane Q value as well as the I square statistics. Uh, our heterogeneity was moderate around 66%, but this impelled us to perform a sensitivity analysis. Now, what's that? A sensitivity analysis tells us the impact that each study has on the summary outcome, outcome and the summary effect. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so my favorite slides, the results section. Uh, out of 4590 patients, uh, we found that 682 were diabetics, while the rest 3900 were non-diabetics. Look at the forest chart. The meta-analysis clearly shows that the unadjusted odds ratio was significant for patients with diabetes, with the odds ratio turning out to be 1.89 and the p-value being significant. Uh, similarly, on performing the sensitivity analysis that I just talked about, we found that after excluding the study Rosenkras et al., the resultant association was much stronger. The odds ratio jumped to 2.07, while the heterogeneity was substantially reduced, I-square being just 15%. Uh, next page, please. Thank you. That's it. Uh, secondary, I would like to talk about a bit much about our patient characteristics and study population. We found that a whopping majority, 67% of them were women. Uh, of those, hypertension was the most commonly associated comorbidities. And we also noticed that there was not much difference between the mean age of our diabetics and non-diabetic cohorts. Next page, please. So to conclude, I would like to talk about one exciting feature of our study and that's our strength. Uh, to our knowledge, we believe that this is the first ever systematic review and meta-analysis conducted on this topic. Uh, our included studies had a very low risk of bias, which were confirmed using appropriate tools. We used the Cochrane, uh, Cochrane tool for RCTs and the NIH scale for the cohort studies. Coming to limitations, we agree that we had some limitations. Now our data is observational, therefore no causal inferences can be drawn. 
some studies were adjusted for factors like obesity and hypertension, and some were not. And uh, finally, we searched only the two main databases, PubMed and MBase, and we did not include data from other bases such as Scopus, Web of Science, or even Google Scholar. A uh, little bit ahead. The most exciting part is the future directions. What does our paper mean? Why is it relevant? Uh, our paper propels research into the pathophysiological mechanisms of how exactly diabetes affects mortality in pH patients to establish a causal association and also to find if the mortality is different between the diabetics and the non-diabetic groups as eventually this might affect the entire treatment considerations in the pH populations. Uh, that's it from my side. Thank you so much. I'm Dr. Smitesh Parte and I'm open for all questions right now. Thank you very much, Dr. Smitesh. Uh, that was a very comprehensive presentation and uh, over to our judges for any questions. Yes. Yes, uh, Dr. Parte, it was a great presentation. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much for that. Uh, my question is, so <clears throat> uh, pulmonary hypertension, right? So right. Uh, yes, definitely diabetes. This is one of the, uh, 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 like the causative factor which can uh, lead to like the pulmonary hypertension, but there mm -hmm. could be other like the diseases which can also affect like the pulmonary hypertension. The most common ones are like the COPD, CHF, right? So uh, during your, uh, like the meta-analysis and systemic review, did you find that like those diabetic patients, they had also those conditions which can also influence this condition, right? Uh, so how was it? How was the data about that? Like the yes, uh, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Excellent question. So as I mentioned in my limitations, we found that there could be potential confounders in our meta-analysis. Obesity mm -hmm. being the most common ones as obesity, as BMI has an inverse association with mortality and that has been well established by previous systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Uh, we also found that a lot of a lot of patients, pH group had multiple comorbidities. Uh, as we know that WHO divides pH into five categories. So we have not been able to have separate data into those categories, which might tell us if we divide it separately, which might give us a clearer picture. If, you know, people with only diabetes mellitus are associated with it, as I said, we need to establish a causal association. So maybe further research into that can help us get better answers out of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Smitesh, and uh, the other judges as well. We will now move forward with our next presenter. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Mohammed Mahdi Murtada, joining us from Poland. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, I will be sharing my screen. Please let me know once you can see it. Okay. Yes, I can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I will start. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Mohammed Mahdi Murtada. I'm a medical doctor and PhD candidate in the Department of Immunology and Allergy at the Medical University of Łódź in Poland. And my main uh, research focuses on the topic of local allergic rhinitis. For today's presentation, I will be sharing some of our preliminary results based on the objective and subjective assessment of patients, of lower patients after nasal provocation. Can you please move to the next slide? Okay. First of all, just small background about the topic. Uh, allergic rhinitis is a very common condition. Statistics shows that around 30% of adults and 40% of children are affected by allergic rhinitis. And apart from the typical allergic rhinitis phenotype and its standard clinical manifestation, characterized by rhinorrhea, sneezing, nasal itching, and congestion, the local allergic rhinitis, or LAR, can be observed in a subset of affected subjects. However, uh, this uh, uh, disease is uh, like diagnosed based on the same symptoms seen in allergic rhinitis. However, specific immunoglobulin E sensitization cannot be ascertained, neither through skin prick testing nor through serum specific Ig assessment. And additionally to that, the mechanisms of local allergic inflammation in large subjects are not yet fully elucidated. Next slide, please. Yes, all of them. Okay, thank you. So the main uh, aim of uh, this part of the study is the assessment of NPT, nasal provocation testing, and the clinical symptoms analysis and diagnostic process of local allergic rhinitis. For the nasal provocation, we are using two allergens, house dust mite and grass pollen. And for this purpose, we are using uh, the sublingual immunotherapy tablets for both uh, allergens. We are dissolving them in saline solution and giving them to the, to the subjects through nasal puffs. And then we are assessing uh, the 
subjects based on two methods. First of all, the TN TNSS and VAS score, which is a questionnaire that we are giving to the subjects to fill before and after nasal provocation, and also through rhinoscopy, like we are assessing the nasal mucosa of the subjects for any swelling, um, congestion, or discharge. Uh, the number of subjects included in this part of the presentation are 11 suspected lower patients. And here you can see the IRB, which is the Bioethical Committee approval number from the Medical University of Puja. Next slide, please. This is just the preliminary results. It's, we will go later to the graphs, but uh, just to say that we can divide our results based on three groups. First one with the positive NPT result, second with negative, and the third one with doubtful results, which we're gonna elaborate on later. Next one, please. And yes, here we divided the uh, results in three main divisions just to uh, better visualize uh, for the uh, participants of the conference. The first group is patients with a positive NPT results, and those are patients who uh, like felt uh, symptoms after nasal provocation. And we can see that there's association between positivity of the NPT and also scores of uh, TNSS and VAS as they are increasing after nasal provocation. For the negative NPT results, we can see that the TNSS and VAS score are either the same or decreasing after nasal provocation, so they are less. And for the most important group, most like uh, uh, exciting group in our uh, study is the doubtful results. Uh, those are subjects who felt some symptoms. And in addition to that, we have increase in TNSS and VAS scores. And also for those subjects, we saw that there's increase in swelling, redness, and discharge when we assess, assess them through rhinoscopy. So next one. <clears throat> now, why we're doing this? For now, NPT is a gold standard in lower diagnosis. It's still used as gold standard diagnostic approach for lower patients. However, as we saw, results may be inconclusive or inconsistent. A combination of NPT and TNSS VAS may be more specific in evaluating lower subjects. More information can be acquired through IG assessment in nasal secretions, which is planned in further stages of the study. Actually, we are uh, waiting for the kids to arrive in order to assess IgE at the level of nasal mucosa, as well as a panel of several mediators for inflammation. And the main uh, thing that we can benefit from this uh, results, if we will be able to have good results, is that proper identification of lower patients may contribute into modification of immunotherapy guidelines. And then those subjects, because they are underdiagnosed today, then they might be able to benefit from early diagnosis and then early treatment, which will help them in decreasing the like uh, negative uh, outcomes of the disease later on their lives. And also assessment of mediators and nasal secretions may provide new insights into endotypical and also phenotypical classification of allergic rhinitis. Next slide. That's my uh, Twitter feed and thank you. Any questions, please? Just thank you very much. Very well timed, Dr. Mohammed. Yeah. And it Thank you. Uh, your presentation. Uh, we will now uh, move forward to our judges for any questions from their side. Hey, uh, Dr. Murtada, thank you yeah. for your presentation. It was a great presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, so what is the, I couldn't find the data, but like what is the uh, uh, sensitivity and specificity of this test? You mean the nasal provocation? Yes. It's, uh, it's quite sensitive. It's used as the gold standard for diagnostic lower subjects, but mm. not always we can see that it's giving like uh, good results uh, when some patients cannot like have proper uh, reaction to the allergen when we are using nasal provocation. So it's still as gold standard until now, but we are trying to find like some combination to increase the sensitivity and specificity of, of this. Right, right, right. So, but you don't have any specific number? Like oh, you mean like percentages or specificity and sensitivity? Oh. Okay maybe around like 70, 60, 70%, something okay. like that. Yeah. Right, right, right. Because it's the gold standard in diagnosis. Basically, when we have patients that have the same, same symptoms as allergic rhinitis, we check mm -hmm. for, uh, we do is the skin prick testing if it's negative for mm -hmm. that specific allergen. And we also check for uh, SIG in serum if it's also negative. Then we just do the nasal provocation with that allergen. If it's positive, then we can go through the yeah. diagnosis. But still some patients are, cannot be diagnosed through this method and they are underdiagnosed. Yeah. Right, right, right. And this uh, LAR uh, diagnosed patient could have like the systemic uh, uh, allergic reactions as well, right? Uh, and LAR can could you, be part of it. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the question, please? I couldn't hear. 
Yeah, uh, I said like the uh, this could be a part of systemic allergic reaction as well, right? So yeah, yeah. That like the how uh, like uh, how many percentage of people they had like the both. Uh, like the systemic uh, along with the low yeah we have allergy. some we have a subset of uh, patients in our study I didn't include the, in this presentation because we don't have like the total number of recruited subjects that uh, they are like subjects called dual allergic rhinitis those mm. subjects have both like allergic rhinitis and local allergic rhinitis at the same time but we are still recruiting the subject they are present but not as much as local allergic rhinitis patients yeah, yeah. Less. Yeah, much less thank you Thank you again, and uh, our, our listeners will continue to ask questions in the chat, so we encourage okay. our uh, speakers to answer them directly. Okay, thank you. Perfect. So moving on to our next presenter is Dr. Priyal Mehta. Uh, Dr. Priyal is also one of our uh, current scholars at GRRSP, and uh, we will be sharing my screen now. Um, Excellent. Yes. Please uh, begin presenting Dr. Peel once you see this. Yes, uh, Dr. Fazel, before even my slides have a lot of animation. So if you could load the entire slide, that would be very helpful. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Thank you, JRSP, for this wonderful opportunity. I'm here to present a case report on worsening adrenal insufficiency and development of autonomic dysfunction in a patient with adrenal hypoplasia congenita following COVID-19 infection. Uh, I, I want to thank Dr. Pranjal, Dr. Rahul Kashyap, Dr. Smitesh Bharte for helping me with this case report. Next. Uh, as Dr. Dave mentioned earlier that our memory of the pandemic has been very bleak, but we do know that 6 million fatalities were caused due to this virus. And because of researchers like us, there is extensive data on the negative effects of COVID-19 on the entire human physiological system, not just the respiratory system, one of which is the autonomic dysfunction, which is fairly poorly understood complication of COVID-19. Uh, adrenal hypoplasia congenita is a rare cause of con congenital adrenal insufficiency, which is generally caused by mutations of genes in the synthesis of steroids or even adrenal cortex development. There's one more point missing, Dr. Fezzik. Uh, we know that primary adrenal insufficiency is the presentation of AHC, but the most important cause and the most common cause in pediatric patients is the CAH, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, not hypoplasia. Uh, let's start with the case. Next slide, please. A 41-year-old female with known history of adrenal hypoplasia congenita presented to the ER with generalized weakness, hypotension, hypothermia, and lower abdominal pain. There was diffuse abdominal tenderness. Significant findings on admission were hyponatremia, hypoglycemia, normal differential but slightly elevated white count. Uh, urine test showed glucose positive slightly trace ketones and high urine sodium. Because of our complaints of abdominal pain, we did CT scan of her abdomen, which showed non-specific diffuse colitis. The patient was thus deemed to be in adrenal crisis and was started on stress dose of steroids. Next. Administration of steroids led to improvement in her serum sodium levels, but unfortunately she developed hypokalemia, which was then replaced. She continued to show improvement with stable readings of 90 or 100 systolic blood pressure, and her steroid was then started to taper down to the uh, dosage that she took prior to this incident. However, she remained symptomatic at this dose with complaints of feeling weak, dizzy, and tired occasionally. And the blood pressure readings during these episodes were mid-60 to 70 uh, mm blood pressure systolic. This necessitated an increased dose of prednisone to 15 milligrams a day just to maintain her blood pressure when she was discharged. Next. She maintained, she had maintained a stable dose of 5 milligrams of prednisone and 0.1 milligrams of fludrocortisone for over 25 years. So what changed? Unfortunately, she contracted COVID-19 back in January 2022. She was hospitalized for worsening hypotension and hyponatremia even at that time. The doses of fludrocortisone and prednisone were increased to the dose that she took before this incident, which was 0.2 milligram and 7.5 milligrams respectively. But this led to incomplete resolution of symptoms. She had been having recurrent symptoms after her discharge of COVID-19 
but she did not seek medical care and ultimately presented to ER in an adrenal crisis. This sudden change in her completely controlled condition indicated that she developed worsening adrenal insufficiency and some degree of autonomic dysfunction after the COVID infection, which responded to higher doses of prednisone and flutocortisone. Next. Autonomic dysfunction has been reported as a clinical feature of both active and post-infectious complication of COVID-19. It is hypothesized that autonomic dysfunction is due to the active pro-inflammatory state in the body, cytokine-induced hypovolemia and vasodilation. There are many post-infectious complications, the most common being the POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, others being OCHS, small fiber neuropathy, altered uh, pupillary reactivity, etc. Next. Our patient also suffered from adrenal hyperplasia congenita, which is a very rare disorder. The pathophysiology of AHC is not very well understood. It's generally a genetic disorder with mutations in steroid synthesis and adrenal cortex development. Most patients present in the first week of their lives with recurrent hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, hyperpigmentation, but normal external genitalia. One of the most fatal complications of AHC would be an adrenal crisis, especially in the presence of stressors like colitis or COVID-19 infection. As we see in our case, this unfortunate overlap of both hormonal and neuroxial dysautonomia led to a very complicated concurrent diagnosis. Next. Our case underscores the importance of routine extensive monitoring in patients with adrenal insufficiency, particularly in the presence of COVID-19, which may exacerbate the symptoms. Clinicals, uh, clinicians should consider the possibility of autonomic dysfunction, should keep their eyes open because it is very, 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 very easy to miss this diagnosis. Our case reports begs three important questions. What is the exact mechanism of autonomic dysfunction in COVID-19? Can we use autonomic dysfunction as a prognostic mar marker for COVID, the severity, to predict disease outcome and morbidity? And what is the true prevalence of dysautonomia in COVID-19, which can help clinicians make this diagnosis faster and easier and lead to less complications like adrenal crisis and mortality? Next slide, please. Thank you. This is it. I'm open for questions now. Thank you very much, Dr. Priyal. This was a very interesting case for us to learn from and shows the diversity of presentations we have today. Uh, over to our judges for any questions from their side. Uh, I have a question. Um, this case study provides valuable insights into the potential effects of post COVID 19 on patients with adrenal insufficiency and uh, high doctor future research on this area. So uh, when you want to discuss about the limitations of the study or the bias or confounding factors on the study, uh, what would you say confounding factors or comorbidities that may have contributed to the paper condition? What would you say? Uh, okay, I'm not sure if I understood it right, so I'll repeat what I understood. Uh, what are the confounding factors in such presentations with COVID-19 and adrenal hypoplasia congenita? Is that correct? Yeah. So the confounding factors would be thank you for the questions very very and the the basis of this case report is this because it is very easy to miss this diagnosis because the presentation is same as an exacerbation of AHC the presentation is of adrenal crisis there's hypotension there's weakness and these are very mild and common symptoms and it is very easy to overlook these symptoms if we don't know that uh, this is especially one of the complications of COVID-19. So if we uh, if we spread awareness about this, even the clinicians would keep an eye out for this, and it is it will be easier to save patients if they present with adrenal crisis. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, and uh, okay. on to our next presenter here, we have uh, Mr. Aman Sandhu, who is uh, joining us. Aman, if you can uh, hear us. I can hear you. Yes, perfect. So I'll be sharing my screen now and you can start presenting as soon as you see the screen. I can see your screen. Yep, I can begin. Hi, everybody. My name is Aman Sandhu. I'm a first year medical student here at the Drexel University College of Medicine located in the United States. Uh, I'd like to thank the GRRSP team for having me today. 
and letting me showcase the case report I worked on with Dr. Wynn and Dr. Georgie. It is called Aggressive Biology of Extranodal NK T cell Lymphoma, and we can begin. So a bit of background, extranodal NK T cell lymphoma, short uh, ENKTL, is a rare and aggressive form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that affects primarily the nasal cavity and sinuses. It's primarily diagnosed through biopsy, immunohistochemistry, and molecular testing, and treatment usually involves some sort of radiation regimen. In this case, we're going to talk about a 62-year-old female who, despite localized presentation, uh, had seen the cancer spread from her nasal cavity to her pancreas within the span of three months. Next slide. Uh, can we load the whole slide, please? This should be another. Yep, perfect. Uh, yes, so March 2022, we have a 62-year-old woman with no significant medical history presenting with a chief complaint of nasal congestion. And she was inert, uh, initially diagnosed with allergic rhinitis. We know a little bit more about that thanks to Dr. Muhammad. And she was put on a standard regimen of Augmentin and prednisone, but her symptoms progressed. And then three months later, she returns complaining of that same nasal progression uh, congestion and her symptoms progressed to include facial swelling as well. And eventually a CT and MRI were ordered and they showed indeterminate soft tissue thickening along the anterior nasal cavity. MRI showed the same thing as well. Next slide, we can see the uh, pictures. Yep, so on the left, we can see the MRI facials showing that enhanced tissue, soft tissue mass in the nasal cavity. And then on the right, we can see the PET scan showing the avid mass extending from the anterior right nostril. Next slide, please. And biopsy further confirmed that this was ENKTL. Left side, we can see the uh, picture of that biopsy showing the in infiltrate as well as ulceration. On the right side, we can see the inside true hybridization for Epstein-Barr virus showing those neoplastic lymphocytes in the tissue. Next slide, please. And upon this diagnosis, she was put on radiation therapy, which initially was going well. She had noted decreased facial swelling and nasal congestion, and everything was going good until October 2022, halfway into the treatment pro protocol, she developed significant dysphagia and anorexia, which was initially perceived to be part of that radiation therapy. So it was paused, but then uh, she was noted to have elevated liver enzymes and Eventually, she was hospitalized for obstructive jaundice on October 18th, and the decision was made to do a common bile duct stent, which, as you can see from the table, did help in lowering her liver enzymes closer to normal. And <laughs> later on, another CT and biopsy were ordered of her abdomen, and they showed a soft tissue mass on her pancreatic head, and biopsy of that confirmed that the cancer had spread. Uh, from her nasal cavity to her uh, pancreas. So next slide, please. And here we can see the images. Uh, left side, we can see the uh, CT of the abdomen showing that pancreatic head mass. And right side, we can see the fine needle aspiration showing the same infiltrate that was, infil that was in her nasal cavity. Next slide, please. And her progression. So the hospital course was showing worsening symptoms. She started to have dyspnea with multiple bilateral lung masses in the chest. Uh, bronchoscopy revealed poorly preserved fragments of fungus. Those were later seen to be fragments of candida albicans. And despite treatment with antifungals, her condition rapidly declined until she was put on hospice care. Next slide. So discussion. Uh, ENKTL nasal type can progress rapidly despite initial treatment. Early diagnosis, prompt treatment, and continuous monitoring are important in managing this type of lymphoma and avoiding personal uh, potential treatment-related complications. Uh, we, we see the importance of a multidisciplinary approach, including chemotherapy, as well as systemic surveillance, which is needed for effective treatment of ENKTL. And this is the third documented case of pancreatic invasion due to this type of lymphoma. Next slide. And in conclusion, it is important to understand the aggressive nature and potential to invade beyond the presenting region. When it comes to ENKTO, extensive monitoring and treatment are required to detect primary and secondary infections. 
Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Aman. It was uh, quite, I think, uh, an interesting presentation and the way you've taken through a journey of this case was uh, interesting to see. Uh, we'll move forward with our judges for any questions from their side. Uh, congratulations, very interesting presentation. So my question is regards, it regards the management of this patient. Did she receive any antifungal prophylaxis? Uh, yeah, she received antifungals during her uh, hospital course, but uh, unfortunately it wasn't enough to recover her condition. Do you, uh, you, do you do a prophylactic testing for any possible fungal infections in these patients with immunosuppression? Uh, I'm not sure if that was done in this case in particular. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aman. That is all from your side. And we will move to our next presenter. Uh, this is Dr. Mariam Asif, who will be presenting with us. Uh, Dr. Mariam, if you're with us, I will be sharing my screen and you can let me know when you see the screen. Yes, I can see the screen now. Perfect. You can begin your presentation. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mary Massif, and I'd like to thank everyone today for giving me this opportunity to present uh, my poster titled Improved Survival in Adolescents and Young Adult Patients Aged Between 14 to 55 Years with Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia Using a Pediatric Inspired Chemotherapy Protocol, a retrospective analysis of a real-world experience in 79 of the patients treated at our National Tertiary Care Hospital here in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, which is King Faisal Specialized Hospital. Next slide, please. So in our study, we were basically treating the adult patient and the adults and patients between the ages 14 and 55 years old with acute lymphoblastic leukemia with the pediatric chemotherapy rather than the traditional adult chemotherapy protocol, which is the allogenic stem cell transplant, because this allogenic stem cell transplant is known to yield poor outcomes. And most of the available data for using this pediatric inspired protocol in adult patients is derived from well-controlled clinical trials. So in our study, we aim to provide a real world experience from using a pediatric inspired protocol in the adult population um, so that we in the National Tertiary Care Referral Center. Next slide, please. So our target population was again, uh, the adolescents and the young adults between the ages 14 to 55 years old over a span uh, period of 2015 to 2021. Uh, and we had 79 patients the variables that we looked on was the first one was the minimal residual disease, which we utilize as a powerful prognostic tool. And it was measured with a sensitivity of 0.01%. Then we had complete remission, which was defined as 5% of less bone marrow blasts at the end of the induction phase of the chemotherapy. And then the primary outcomes that we measured in the study was the event-free survival, the disease-free survival, and the overall survival, along with the toxicities. Now, a little bit about the chemotherapy protocol in these patients was that it was mainly divided into three phases. The first one being pre-phase, induction phase, the second one, and the third one was the consolidation phase. Now, the pre-phase, we used the corticosteroids so that we could reduce the chances of tumor lysis syndrome in the patients. Induction phase was the 28-day um, phase, and then followed by, followed by that, we had the consolidation phase. We had other phases as well, like the interim maintenance, intensification for patients who tend to have positive results in terms of their complete remission. And then the minimal residual disease was evaluated at two occasions, once at, after the induction period, primarily for the prognostic factors, and once at the end of the final stage, which is the consolidation phase, so that we know that if the patient was chemo-resistant or not. And in case they were chemo-resistant, if their MRD was positive, then we did proceed with an allogenic stem cell transplant. Next slide, please. Um, for a statistical analysis, we had the three groups, the disease-free survival, in, uh, event-free survival, and overall survival, which we evaluated using the Kaplan-Mare curve. Next slide, please. 
Now, our results were promising because we showed an established complete remission rate after induction chemotherapy stage, which was achieved in 70 patients out of our 79 patients. And day 28 post-induction, which was the last day of induction, the minimal residual disease negativity was confirmed in 58 patients. And the post-consolidation minimal residual disease negativity had increased to 75.9%. That is approximately in 60 patients. 11 patients were chemo-resistant and had to undergo allergenic stem cell transplant. The relapse rate was 13.9%. And the most common adverse events that we noted was infection and transaminitis. Next slide, please. So now here you can look at the three graphs, which is basically telling us about the overall survival rate, the disease-free survival, and event-free survival. The overall survival rate was 75.8%, the disease-free survival was 69.2%, and event-free survival is 57.5%. Next. I would say that our results were extremely promising because they were comparable to the results that we saw in the randomized clinical trial. And therefore, we can see that this pediatric-inspired protocol that we utilize is actually ap 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 applicable to the adult patients because it shows excellent tolerance in terms of the side effects and there's low treatment related morbidity and mortality associated as well. Thank you and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mariam. I think you've looked at a very essential topic here and, and with promising results that uh, hopefully, you know, we'll be discussing further. So any questions at the moment from our judges uh, for this presentation? So my, hello, <clears throat> very interesting presentation. So my questions are regarding uh, any differences you've seen between B cell and T cell, ALL prognosis and response to treatment. And secondly, uh, for relapsed refractory ALL, did you have any access to novel drugs such as vinatumumab or inotuzumab, ozogamycin? Okay, so regarding your first question, you asked if there was difference between the BALL and DLL. We did perform a subgroup analysis, but the results were not statistically significant. And there were poor, poor outcomes in TALL, but as I mentioned, they were not statistically significant. And can I have you repeat the second question again? Uh, how did you manage relapsed refractory ALL? So did you have any access to novel drugs such as blinatumumab or inotuzumab? Uh, no, they were the regular drugs, like the regular chemotherapy protocol, like the danirofacin, vincristin, not the novel drugs. We did not have access. We did not utilize them in our study. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you again, Dr. Mariam, and we hope you uh, stay on to see the other sessions as well coming up. Um, before we sort of uh, move to the next presentation, uh, we just like to check if one of our previous presenters, uh, Tibian Muhammad, is with us right now. We are uh, happy to, of course, resume your, your slides if you, your connection is, is now stable. So can you hear us, Tibian? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and I will be sharing your presentation now. We can resume it and you would have about uh, three minutes to complete this presentation from your side. Okay. Yes, so this, this was a presentation on the clinical presentation of acute kidney injury in the Pediatric Dialysis Center in Sudan. Um, and Tibian, you can now continue your presentation. Okay, regarding my results, uh, the age of the patients were uh, very variable from 33 days to 17 years. The median age was eight years. Uh, the number of the patient regarding their sex, uh, 46 were male, uh, about 60%, uh, and I beg your pardon about uh, the mistake, 30 females, uh, they were presenting for 5%. Most of them were from low socioeconomic uh, state, uh, and that was related to the infectious etiologies, as uh, we will see. Next slide, please.
Uh, regarding the first presenting symptoms, they were fever and red urine and generalized body swelling, respectively. Uh, I listed all the presenting symptoms, but uh, those three were the most frequent. Uh, the mean blood uh, urea was 1.6 milligram per deciliter, and the mean creatinine was uh, 82 uh, milligram per deciliter, and the range uh, was wide, as you, as we could see, because it's an uh, acute kidney injury with a uh, variable presentation. The most common etiology was uh, malaria infection uh, in, in those kids, uh, accounting for 20.9% of the cases. Um, and sepsis and sickle cell nephropathy uh, accounting for 8.2%. In, in Sudan, we have uh, sickle cell disease in, in many tribes. So generally, the etiology included infectious causes, obstructive causes, and congenital causes. Uh, most of the patients recovered with administration. 82.2%. Uh, uh, some of them, 6.6%, uh, needed hospital admission and further workup. And 53 uh, from them uh, progressed to chronic kidney disease. Next slide, please. So this research was uh, a one center research. Uh, multi-center uh, studies are needed to have a clear generalized idea about acute kidney injury in Sudan. Uh, the most common uh, cause uh, or etiology was uh, malaria infection. So further workup uh, in, in preventing malaria and treating it in pediatric is needed. Uh, the lower uh, percentage of unknown cases and the higher percentage of recovery uh, was reflecting a better and earlier diagnosis of acute kidney injury uh, in children. But this result is uh, according to the Selma Center, the center that I have uh, done the research in. Uh, this is my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, and, uh, We are very happy to uh, see that your presentation could be completed despite uh, the challenges, uh, technicalities, but uh, very interesting to see how your study had managed to identify malaria and acute kidney injury as being potentially associated factors there. Um, any thoughts and comments so far from our uh, judges before we conclude this presentation? Hello, uh, this was an inspiring um presentation, thank you, Georgie. And you also mentioned about the future research uh, like for the study. So if you will uh, go to next step for your future plans including this uh, result. Uh, but um, considering the limitations of this study, how would you address the limitations for your further plan? Just, I want to ask you. Sorry, I couldn't. What are the potential limitations of this study and how do you plan to address them for your future research, for your next step? Could you hear me If I could hear you, you asked not very clearly. Please, could you repeat it? Sure. If um, if I may, uh, Professor Banu, I can just sort of rephrase that. So in terms of your, your right. current study, uh, uh, to be and any potential limitations that you came across that may have influenced any of the factors in your study? Yes, um, it was uh, a unicentral uh, research that does not reflect the whole Sudan. Uh, second, I, I had um, a gap in the patient forms because we have the lockdown of COVID-19. Uh, I had the five-year uh, uh, patient forms, but uh, there is like a one year gap uh, because the center was locked because of the lockdown of COVID. Um, so uh, those are part of my limitations. 
Thank you very much, uh, Tibi. And I think that answers the question very well. Um, and uh, any other questions can be taken up in our chat. So thank you for that. Uh, we will now move forward to our uh, late breaking presentation. And this is a very exciting presentation ahead because of uh, its, its global impact that this study is currently making as a flagship project on behalf of the Global Remote Research Scholars Program. Uh, this will be presented by Dr. Akansha Singh, and uh, I'll be sharing my screen soon where we can have this study presented. Good afternoon, uh, respected judges. Um, so I'm very excited to be presenting our research topic on nomophobia. Personally, I've been uh, interested in this topic since I was in my residency last year. And I cannot imagine myself personally without being like not having my smartphone with me. So I'm really grateful uh, towards Dr. Rahul Kashyap and his team who were very instrumental in um, helping me channelize my idea and also think of uh, presenting a global survey. So our topic is global 3P study, which is providers phonelessness phobia. Uh, next slide, please. So what is nomophobia? It's actually no mobile phone phobia, and it refers to discomfort, anxiety, nervousness, or anguish that could be ca caused out of being out of mobile phone for a long time. So nomophobia is a bit difficult to diagnose because it shares symptoms with other conditions such as anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, and specific phobias such as claustrophobia or even agoraphobia. So it's very important that physicians should exclude all other disorders uh, before thinking about nomophobia and uh, relating it to the cause of patient symptoms. Uh, next slide, please. So the aim of the study was to explore the prevalence, magnitude, and other related factors of nomophobia among healthcare providers. So what I'm doing is that I'm just presenting preliminary data from our first seven days since our launch on April 1st, 2023, and we had 1,000 responses. We're conducting an observational cross-sectional study using a web-based survey. Uh, we're implementing a modified nomophobia uh, questionnaire. The original one consisted of 20. Uh, we had to remove six questions from the original one because they were repeated. And we also were able to add uh, two new sections one revolving around our common habits uh, with smartphone use, and the second being the time that we spend on our personal uh, usage of mobile phone, as well as time that we use it for professional uh, related activities. So in all, there were 32 questions, uh, 25 being part of nomophobia and seven belonging to demographics. Thank you. Next slide, please. So this is a global map. And initially in the first seven days, we had maximum responses from India and United States followed by Kenya, Nepal. Next slide, please. So as we see, uh, we had maximum responses from female healthcare providers, nearly 575. Uh, 25 to 30 belong to, um, uh, for around 42% belong to 25 to 35 years of age group followed by 36 to 45, 18, and 25. Uh, nearly 60% uh, belong to the South Asian race, followed by Black, uh, African, Spanish. So um, using a questionnaire, we were able to uh, identify nearly 80% having prevalence of nomophobia, of which 56% uh, had mild and 44% had severe. So from the top five participating countries, India, United uh, States, followed by Nepal, Kenya, and Oman. Next slide, please. So to conclude, the global survey of nomophobia, the preliminary analysis represents the majority of female healthcare providers with the highest age group representation between 25 to 45 years. Uh, the prevalence of nomophobia among the uh, responders was as high as 80% initially in the first seven days. And among them, 56 had mild, 44 had moderate, and none had uh, severe, as per our modified nomophobia uh, questionnaire. Also, I'm happy to share that it's nearly one month in our study since our launch, and we are having 2,800 responses from nearly 80 countries. 
So I would like to personally reach out to you all to help us um, help us by firstly uh, filling out the survey if you haven't, and secondly by helping us reach out to all the healthcare providers network that you have, so that we can reach our uh, ten thousand responses goals in the next two months. Also, I would like to uh, thank my Global Three P study team, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Kanksha. It has been a pleasure listening to your presentation and seeing your efforts in leading the Global 3P study on nomophobia, which, as far as I've heard, it is looking at about 80 countries being represented um, through your collaborative efforts. So well done to you and the team. Um, and I think it's also a very good example of what can be accomplished through the right mentorship efforts. And uh, that's some of the things we see at GRRSP. So if you're interested in a study like this and you're listening to us, you're more than welcome to join in and be a part of making this an even bigger success. Excellent. Uh, so from our side, actually, due to time constraints, uh, we will have any questions directly in the chat box. So uh, that's where our speakers will be uh, answering these questions. And at the same time, this also concludes our abstract presentation session. Um, and we also thank those who've waited uh, and, and stayed back to listen to these talks because we welcome our next keynote uh, speech and and this will be one of of course the highlights of this day. So over to Dr. Uh, Kashyap, who will be introducing our next keynote speech for the day. Absolutely, thank you so much. Fantastic presentation, and we want to end the day on a very high note. Uh, this is our uh, uh, end out keynote session number two. Uh, we have a fascinating speaker, uh, Doctor Lieutenant Colonel, active U.S. Army, uh, uh, Doctor uh, Chef So Cook. Uh, who is an active lieutenant uh, in U.S. Army as a battalion commander at Fort Maiden in Maryland. Uh, he received a doctorate degree from Tufts University. He has been a guest, guest, spoke, uh, guest speaker and widely published on the topic of leadership, influence, organizational change, innovation, and mentorship. He is the founder of the Military Mentors, one of the nonprofit role as well. So we thought to bring out experts from a different field to see how we can learn and apply some of those principles. I've, I've seen him given a talk on mentorship during crisis, and we all go through a personal or uh, academic crisis from month to month and day to day. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Cook uh, to share the stage and then uh, share with us uh, some of his uh, tidbits, his wisdom uh, from all you guys for the next 20 minutes. Dr. Cook. All right, I want to make sure everybody can see my screen. Yes. All right, it's great. So it's great to be here with you for the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, feel free to uh, throw some questions in the chat. I'll see them. Uh, hopefully we'll get around to them. Uh, hopefully you enjoy a, just a couple of slides, not a lot of words, uh, mainly pictures, because that's how I like to use PowerPoint in the original form. And you can see uh, on there some of my contact information if you want to follow up afterward with a conversation. Obviously, I'm, I'm from outside you all space. Right, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a uh, psychology kind of guy. So real soft science, real easy stuff. But what I've learned over time uh, from my experience in, uh, over two decades in the special operations community in the United States Army is that humans are more important than hardware. So I'm sure a lot of you have a lot of technological equipment that you may use with a patient or that may be in your offices. But without the human touch, without your hand, without your caring heart, and without your medical expertise that happens to reside in your hands or in your head, um, it would be all for naught. The utensils we all use would be all for naught. So with that in mind, we're gonna talk a little bit about mentoring today and about how you can develop those around you uh, to be the best medical professionals that they are, but in general, the best leadership uh, leaders that they can be, and the best probably uh, global citizens, because I think there's a couple of people on here from across the globe, and we care about that. So I'm going to dive right into what I think uh, our definition, what I think the best definition is of mentoring, but I want to caveat that by saying, if you go way, way, way back in time, you'll see that we didn't come up with this idea of mentoring. So anybody who's read the Odyssey, 
by Homer or might have tucked that away from uh, K through 12 education or high school or something from a long time ago, go dust it off, blow the dust off the top of it and go find in there the story of Odysseus's son, Telemachus, who uh, had the original mentor. Odysseus prays to what is then the god Athena to watch over his son while he's off uh, in battle. And Athena presents herself to Telemachus as a male, as a female, sometimes an old wise gentleman, sometimes a younger person. Uh, and if you think about the LGBTQ plus community today, it's kind of interesting that spectrum of, of presentation to a person. But that's the original idea of mentor. The entity that presented itself to Telemachus called itself mentor as a name. So that's the first place we find it in Homer's Odyssey. Fast forward many, many years to the 1970s. And there's a social psychologist called Daniel Levinson, who's really trying to understand youth mentoring uh, when paired with adults. And what he finds through a lot of study is that not having a mentor is the equivalent, or having a bad mentor is the equivalent of having a bad parent or not having a parent in one's youth. One of his students, fast forward to the eighties, one of his students was Kathy Cram. Kathy Cram today is a Boston, Boston University professor and researcher. Uh, she wanted to understand that context from Daniel Levinson in the adult space. So she started studying workplace mentoring. How do we mentor each other? How do bosses mentor subordinates within the workplace? And Kathy Cram launches a very large qualitative study with a number of focus groups trying to understand organizational and workplace mentorship. She has a book that if you can find it, it's a rarity because it's not in print really anymore. Uh, if you look up Mentoring at Work by Kathy Cram, It'll show you some of what became the original literature for what I will present today. About 40, 50 years worth of research is uh, what I'm presenting today and what military mentors couches all of our activities in. This, if you were to go to our website, is what you'll find. This is an actual screenshot that might be Odysseus as a statue that's from our website. And this is how we, I, uh, we define mentoring in my organization. So I want to go through the terms because terms are very important. A long-term developmental relationship that is reciprocal yet asymmetric. Long-term. So if you're in a mentoring relationship that is about three weeks long, I would tell you that's maybe a friendship or someone that you're getting coffee with, right? Long-term. So the literature, say, literature says that it needs to be at least six months, but preferably a year or longer for it to be truly developmental. You see developmental relationship next. Learning is a purpose, product, and outcome of these relationships. Again, if we're just kind of talking about work, if we're just kind of maybe uh, sharing some of our wins and some of our losses at work, I, you guys are just probably friends. Um, if, it, if it's always at Starbucks and it feels like it's, there's some growth happening, uh, that may not be mentoring, that may be coaching or teaching that's going on. It needs to be really focused on the outcome being development of an individual, hopefully both in the relationship. What is this in piece though? Reciprocal yet asymmetric. What are you talking about, Chevy? Okay. Well, it needs to be reciprocal. If it's a one-way conversation, again, that's probably teaching. That's probably a subject matter expert just pouring all of their knowledge into another person. That's not what we're talking about here. There needs to be a back and forth between the two individuals, the mentoring dyad, in order for this to be true mentoring, development between the two folks um, and a constant conversation. It's on so water. You can get some water in the kitchen, sweetie. It's in the kitchen. That's my little four-year-old. She's coming to uh, make sure my presentation is going okay. All right, so it needs to be reciprocal. There needs to be sharing back and forth between. Uh, if there is, again, if you find yourself in a relationship that you call a mentoring relationship, and it seems like you're just always receiving, it's not reciprocal. And I would argue that's just kind of maybe a professional workplace mentorship uh, relationship and not necessarily mentoring. The last one though, asymmetric. What is this about? Reciprocity, but I need some asymmetry too. Well, what it boils down to 
is one person needs to be doing the vast majority of the learning in the relationship. Here's a shocker for most people. It doesn't matter your age, status, professional degrees, or what have you. If you are doing the majority of the learning in the relationship, if you are doing the majority of the growth and the learning, you are the mentee, regardless of your age or status or position. You can be the CEO of an organization and you think you're in a mentoring relationship where you're pouring all in, but you're receiving more. They're, they're teaching you techniques to, to maybe be more emotionally intelligent. They're teaching you uh, and, and connecting with you on things uh, with regard to be uh, being a better public speaker, using uh, technology more. You, CEO, are the mentee uh, in that relationship. So that's where the asymm asymmetry happens. The person doing the vast majority of the learning and the growth is the mentee is how we would define it. And the mentor is the one doing the vast majority of the leading in the relationship. So that's our definition. Now I want you to eat some pie. I know there's a lot of medical professionals out there that might worry about caloric intake uh, and, and sugars and salts and things in the body, but I'm gonna in, uh, in, uh, encourage everyone here to eat pie and help people to eat pie in their mentoring relationships. So this is some literature, some research as well. This is coming from Lois uh, Zachary and Lisa Fain. They have a great book called Bridging Differences for Better Mentoring. And while it does talk about, you know, bridging difference across our, our normal lines of race, ethnicity, gender, and things like that, it also talks about going across industries and how to close those gaps. They have a beautiful quote in the book that says, once we realize that the differences are between us and not within us, we can grow a lot more. And for you medical professionals, right? If uh, you're doing surgery, I, I guarantee all of our, well, all of our hearts might look very similar. Our livers look really similar unless you do a lot of drinking. Uh, our lungs look very similar unless you do a lot of smoking. But we all know that on the inside, we're, we're, we're humans. We're very, very much the same. So the differences that we find ourselves in, whether it be uh, across race or ethnic or gender lines, or it may be across uh, um, spaces like specialty or places that we work, those are all between us. And that's what you would find in that book, but they would encourage you to eat some pie. Okay, pie is a model, P-I-E. If you were to look at Fortune 500 companies for the last 30 or 40 years, and you ask all the CEOs, CFOs, what have you, what got them to where they are? Only about 10% of them would respond in the survey saying that their performance, the first part of Pi, got them to where they are. 10%. My raw performance got me to this apex. 10%. Okay. I. 30% of them would say that their image got them to where they are. Now, at first blush, image, you would also obviously think, hey, my skin tone, the gender I present. Uh, and that can be a, a mass, uh, a big part of it. How you dress, how you present yourself, right? But it's also all these other factors as well. It's your brand, it's your reputation, it's your expertise, it's your ability to communicate. Those all encompass what your image is. It's a whole of character. In today's world, uh, going into an interview room, everyone will look you up on social media and that'll be a part of your interview before you even show up. That's your image and your brand and your reputation as well. So take note of that. But that's only 30%. So remember, I am a psychologist by trade, soft science, and I was a qualitative researcher. So I'm not a big fan of numbers. I wasn't a chemist or anything like that. So 10 plus 30, let's see if I can get this right. I think that's 40. So out of 100%, I believe we have 60% left. Now, I want to pause for a second, and I want you to think of what that E can potentially be. What potentially is the E? Let's find that E. Someone's unmuted. 
as they're thinking. What do we think E is? Is it experience? No, it's not that. Is it expertise? No, it's not that. Experience and expertise, they both go to your performance. What could E be? Emotional intelligence? Because that we obviously we think that's important. No, because guess what? That goes with your image. Probably also goes with your performance. Man, those are all the, the easy ones. So E is exposure. E is exposure. 60% of those interviewed would say that they were exposed to an opportunity that they didn't think they could have or they didn't see themselves in. So for our global uh, majority folks, but in America, westernized society, minorities, women, usually we can't see ourselves in some of those spaces. I say ourselves because I count myself as a Black American. Exposing me to opportunity, a mentor exposing me to a place that I don't think I, I could be is extremely important. And time after time after time again in these studies, what you find is exposure is what turns people on to an opportunity, a person in a network, or some other thing that they just didn't know that they could have that actually walked them up the ladder of success. So again, I encourage you to eat some pie today, but remember the biggest slice of that pie, if you're looking at my graph on the screen, that red one is exposure. So I'm gonna ask a rhetorical question. Who are you exposing to opportunity? Are they only people in your, in your profession? Are they only people of your gender? Are they only people who are around your settings and your church, mosque, synagogues, whatever that may be? Are they only in your friend network? Are they only in your community, your nearest community? Are you reaching out to people who don't look like you? Are you reaching across sectors? If you're a podiatrist, are you uh, reaching out to someone who's a dentist, right? Are you looking at these different spheres? Exposure is the most important thing with regard to mentoring. And here's my last set of pictures. And this one actually has a couple of words on them. So most of, most of it's been pictures thus far, but I'll leave you with a couple words. I told you a lot of things about mentoring thus far. I'm going to tell you some things to avoid. Here's your pitfalls that we want to avoid. Misplaced focus up front. It's about the mentee. It's not about you as the mentor. So what you do not want to do is walk around with a tally. You know, I got 25 mentees and look at all the degrees and things they've done. No, it's, a, it's about them, not you. So please don't misplace your focus. The next one, we tend to look at those that are gonna be the next level professionals. They're the top tier people, rising stars, or we look at the folks who are really struggling around us, really struggling in our organizations, and we focus on the development of them. 10%. Your top 10% or your bottom 10% is where we focus. I would argue that the best mentors can find spaces for those people in the 80%, those people in the middle band. What are you doing to find the average worker uh, that's not necessarily a rock star, not necessarily um, making any mistakes in your space? What are you doing to develop them? The next one is patronage. Uh, unfortunately, this one affects the female gender more often than not. Quid pro quo is never good. This for that and these relationships is not good. I have heard both in the military and industry over the time that I've been doing this, almost a decade now of this consulting in this nonprofit space, that more often than not, um, women face um, some type of sexual innuendo in those relationships. Hey, if you mail to a female supposed mentee, hey, I can do some things for you if you're willing to do some things for me. And you can fill in the blank with your own ideas of what that means. I would ask if you're one of those guys out there doing it, absolutely, please stop. If you're one of the women experiencing that and you need um, a way to report it, my uh, my LinkedIn information, my contact information will not change. You bring it to me and I will find a way to get it to your leadership. 
So we need to make sure we're watching for patronage. That can happen in a lot of other ways too, right? It can happen with, you know, guys and guys, and it, it might not be even be um, sexual. It can be just the nature of, I'm going to do something you, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. There, we don't need that at all in these mentoring relationships. Cultural gender humility. Now, the military has taught me a lot of different things about um, uh, going off into foreign countries and uh, having this exquisite knowledge of a place I may be. And I've been fortunate enough to uh, travel the world to um, do the things that I do for the Army. And they taught me a, a phrase that I really like got rid of um, as soon as they taught it to me. They, they said I needed to have cultural competence. I needed to grow this cultural competence. I will tell you, I'm not culturally competent about being a Black American, so I don't know how I could even do that to try to understand somebody in another space, in another place. With regard to both gender and cultures, I want us to practice humility. I have a long-standing mentee. He looks like me. He's actually from just up the street. I've known him since he was 14. He's 39 years old. That's 25 years I've known this gentleman. Long-standing men mentoring relationship. We come from the same background, same place. We went to the same high school, just not at the same time because I'm a bit older than him. Um, but I have to walk into that, rela that relationship with a lot of humility. We are both Black males from the same place and space in Columbia, South Carolina. But he has his own lived experience, and I have my own. So I have to come to that relationship every single time with a lot of humility because I don't know his lived experience. I only know my own. And I would encourage everyone out there as you're mentoring to do the same thing across uh, whatever spectrum they may be. And the last one, I, I, bet, I, I would beg, I would, I, I bet there's a couple people out there that are in the Star Wars, maybe one or two out there that might love Star Wars and know a little thing about it. And Star Wars has been around for a, a long time. As long as I've been alive, these, these movies have come out and been refreshed and revamped. We all know Star Wars. Well, cloning in Star Wars was bad that we all know. Cloning in this space, mentoring, is bad as well, okay? What we do not want to do is just create another little mini you. And if you notice that a mentor that you have is always just trying to push you to become what they are, that's not good. And you need to call that out. If you're doing that yourself, if you're just trying to make another mini version of you, I will tell you, you need to stop. Well, this is not about cloning. I will tell you that this is about creating somebody that can walk their own path from their point A to their point B to their point C and so forth. Not their point A and you vector them to, to your point B and so forth. Of, of course, you're going to take care of them. You're going to want to do the right thing for them. But I would encourage you to not clone. That was my last slide. That's all I got. I'd uh, hope that there are a question or two out there and, and I'll, I'll uh, see if there is an opportunity for me to, to answer some things, if there are. Um, I'm gonna pause there and now I'm trying to scroll through the, the chat. I see there, yep, yeah, uh, somebody put exposure in here. That's good. So somebody, somebody found it. Um, I see emotions, empathy. I do something if you do something for me in a mentor mentor relationship is a gray area with gender for sure. Most misused. Um, I love all that. Thank you. Yeah, this is great stuff in here. Two, a couple of new messages. Let's see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I'm glad I didn't bore anybody. Uh, <laughs> it looks like it was, a, I did the right thing for you. Thank you, Dr. Cook. This was fantastic based on the emotions, emojis, and people's comment. And we anticipate many of these learners to take the messages and maybe go out on social media and then shout out what they found fascinating from your talk and our previous speakers as well. We are very, very thankful for your time. We really appreciate you being here today. 
in a short period of time, presenting years of research in 20 minutes. So this is not a just justice to your uh, your talent, but I think this was a great uh, tidbit or at least the first exposure to our GRSP group. So we are very, very thankful for you being here today. Thank you. Yes. Please hang around and uh, ask, answer questions. And then speakers, please, uh, our other audience, please ask question, Dr. Cook. Uh, but we would like to move on because to keep on time, we are almost made up on time. So I think now uh, the final session before we go. So I would like to uh, provide note to thank to not only our, our keynote speakers, our panelists as well, and all, all of those who have presented today and then who's, who uh, came in today. So I could understand that many folks we have today are from war torn countries or at least neighboring countries. We have presenters from Poland, we have presenters from Sudan and other places as well. So huge gratitude. And then probably uh, we try to see how we can help you. So maybe if there are opportunities from GRSP to support you guys, especially from uh, Ukraine or Sudan or any other conflict areas, we will bring it to you in your future. But we are very, very thankful for you to be here today. This was our first attempt. We have never had our GRSP annual Congress. And then you all made it a grand success to based on our, we have some hiccups, technology, we all anticipated nobody had a heart attack or a stroke, especially an organizer because we were anticipating some issues and things like that. But at large, it went really well, very quality presentation, so on and so forth. But there's one group which has not been actually recognized so far because we want to keep them a secret uh, to protect their identity because they were the judges. So I would like to raise uh, judges, uh, you're with us today. I would like to raise uh, you to raise your hands. Uh, and then I would like to see if I can uh, tag you there as well. So you can raise your virtual hands because you are all over the places and I can actually uh, uh, put you uh, as one of the, uh, uh, pins or spotlights. If you can't show your picture, then we can't probably not uh, pin you. But let me see if I can figure out something in this regard. Uh, yes, Lorraine, that'll be fantastic if you can. Uh, and then we have Dr. Vakaria, Vakar Vakar please your virtual hand as well. Um, so I'm going to say a few names right there. Then Dr. Podar, if you are still with us or not, I'm going to tell. Our judges today were Dr. Laureen uh, Sebapolo, maybe doctor or just on, uh, soon, becoming a doctor soon. Dr. Dom uh, Williams, uh, Dr. Vivek Podar, Dr. Banu Kose, Dr. Priti Vakaria, and Dr. Menha Gaman. Now we can go ahead and add you to the website because we don't want you to be, uh, uh, you know, people seeking undue influence and things like that. But we are very, very thankful for your work. It was high paced environment. Uh, you, were not, you had so many questions. We allowed you to ask only one question and things like that. But uh, I think uh, you guys did a very good job. So please help me uh, give a big round of applause for our, uh, our judges, our keynote speaker who's here today. So thank you so much for you guys making it possible to judge. Otherwise uh, it'll be an extra burden on us as well. So uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, for doing that uh, for as well. Um, now I would like to probably, you wanna know if you are, have some best presenters or not, or maybe just end the meeting, what do you guys think? I think they were all fantastic presentations. Everybody's a winner, but I think judges were uh, able to tease out maybe, you know, maybe a couple of them in each session who did really above and beyond than everybody else. So are you ready to hear out who's, who's those folks are? So let me share my screen with you and see if we can find out. Uh, let me know if you guys see it. Uh, can you see it, what I'm sharing with you? Yes, no. Yes. Yes, all right. Yes. That's fantastic. So this is our award ceremony, award session for those who presented today. So. There's no secret. If you do not present today, you are not winning an award. That is for sure. Okay. Now I can guarantee you that that's not going to happen. Uh, you all are winners because you did a fantastic presentation. So please take a, a big, a big, uh, I would say tap on your shoulder. Did a really, really good job as well. All of you should be getting a certificate uh, in mail. So we have to get your email ID or maybe we can send you a PDF of that. So that's the fastest way of getting that Paul. Uh, this is not my decision, so you can't kill the messenger. Uh, we already showed with you who are the judges, so then now they should be on your target uh, if anything comes out. So I think uh, we said there's no first, second, third, fourth place. We want to give you top four presenters uh, who did the best job uh, in two in first session and two in second session as well. So first of them, uh, 
have a drum roll and please show your love and, and affection and uh, emojis and all those things. So first best presentation about goes to Dr. Zainab Muhammad uh, for, uh, for all uh, uh, good job. I think the content then the delivery, those are the two parts. And then how you responded to questions was the three criteria were used. And it looked like that you might have excel in all three of them if, uh, uh, or most of them in this regard. For consistency, we put everybody MD. So if don't get, get offended if you are MBPS or MBPCH or DO, but now for consistency, we either are doctor or soon to be a doctor. So please don't be upset with that part. So congratulations, Zainab. Where are you, Zainab? Uh, you can, uh, judges, you can turn down your ha uh, hands and maybe, Zainab, you want to raise your hand, virtual hand there. So if you are still with us. Um, yes, I'm with you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Uh, uh, so thank, thank you very you. much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. And thank you for uh, bearing with me with my technical issues. I'm very thankful for that. Absolutely. A good job uh, having a presentation and let us know if this was your first ever presentation uh, yes, at, at actually, this level. Yes, my first conference ever. And you won an award. That is nice. Very Thank good. You. Hang around. We will take a picture with everybody, as especially the awardees with your hands raised. All right. Are we ready for a second person who did a little bit better or maybe in judges' eyes? Are we ready? Yes. All right. Okay. This is Dr. Akanksha Singh with double A, uh, MBBS, DNB, or MBDNB. So uh, Akanksha, I know where you are. Congratulations for being here today. Do you want to say a word? Maybe I would just say a word. Thank you so much, judges and uh, team GRRSP. This was actually my first international conference, and I'm, I'm just uh, numb right now. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Uh, job well done. All right, hang around uh, for a group picture for everybody who's here. So, okay, are we ready for the third one? No, they are not in any rank. Everybody is same. So, the third person uh, who is the best presenter as well. Are we ready? And probably not. Like, no, I don't want to. It's the two is enough. I don't get it. No. All right, let's go to third one. That is uh, Dr. Parte, Smitesh Parte, uh, I believe, is here with us today. Yes. yes. Dr. Parte, what do you want to say? Ah. Uh. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, everyone, the judges, the organizers, and everyone who stayed back and uh, listened to us talk here for, an, for over two and three hours. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's an honor. This is like the first time I've presented internationally on such a huge scale, and uh, I'm excited. I think uh, I like this, so I'm going to go ahead and present more. So thank you so much for this. Well, three out of three are first international presentation. Probably we should have charged you guys at least $100, $200. Uh, you know, this should not be free as well. But anyways, good job. Uh, congratulations uh, for three of you as well. And the final award uh, in, uh, goes to is Mariam Asif, Dr. Asif or soon to be Dr. Asif. Are you here with us uh, today? Yes, you are. Yes, I, I'm here. All right, go ahead. Do you have any few words? Um, yes, I, I wasn't expecting my name to pop up and I'm really glad. Thank you. And um, thank you so much, everyone. And this again, to add to it, it's my first international conference. So I am glad to join and thank you again to the judges, to the panelists and to all the fellow colleagues. Thank you. All right, this is four out of four. Did, uh, did we ask uh, when they, they were submitting that should uh, they should write if their first ever presentation? I don't think that question got asked. Well, it did not influence anybody, but I'm so happy for all of you and four of you a little bit extra happy uh, the, that uh, that adds like your presentation content and questioning, but everybody else did a good job because not all apps had got accepted to even get presented and some people did not even show up. So you are already a winner by presenting it and getting a certificate for that. Uh, Dr. Nawaz, uh, how you want us to take pictures? Because I really want us to take pictures for everybody who can show their faces. Uh, we have like 40 some people and then there's a lot of chat boss going on. So can I take a couple of screenshots and then we go from there? Is that okay? Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think I'd just like to echo the same thing. We're just so happy 
uh, to get to know each of you through these presentations and the hard work you've done uh, in your own personal journeys through research and healthcare. So we couldn't be more proud reading your abstracts, selecting them for presentations, and now some of you even winning uh, or, or awards. So uh, once again, many congratulations. And from our side, we hope you stay in touch with us to be a part of future events at GRRSP. And this is when you can uh, reach out to us by our email, which is grrspofficial at gmail.com, or we have our website, grrsp.com. And you already actually met a couple of our current scholars, alumni, um, a lot of happy faces around, which is maybe a little bit of proof that there's some good work happening in the background. Um, so hopefully you'll join us in that journey and be a part of that as well. Uh, for the uh, sort of uh, pictures, I think, yes, we will sort of uh, take multiple screenshots and uh, have them on our social media channels. So make sure you follow us on social media as well. We're on Twitter and LinkedIn at the moment. Um, so at, on Twitter, that would be um, at underscore GRRSP. And on LinkedIn, you can just search the full name of the program and you should be able to find us and reach out to us. Uh, share your experiences as well. How is today for you out there on social media so that others can listen in and perhaps join on the next uh, conference that we will be hosting. Uh, maybe even in person, we'll be able to see you that way. So uh, thank you again. And I think we're ready to, to have some smiling screenshots and all the poses you have from your own countries. Let's bring them out and we'll get some great pictures in. Okay, I'll stop the recording. I'll, we'll take the pictures and then we'll have Dr. Arshad and Dr. Nawaz close out the conference.